Hello there, everyone. This is Mr. Brass, and today I'm, I have a very special guest, and her name is Hannah Wallen. She is an MRA and an anti-feminist. You know, so this is the newest episode of the Brass Exchange, where we like to discuss interesting topics with interesting people. So, Hannah, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. Um, ben, it's been a busy day. Uh, some of the stuff I can't talk about because I work in healthcare, but it's been been quite a day. Um, but uh, probably the oddest part was coming home to uh, find feminists on Twitter uh, attributing personal agency to fetuses in order to avoid, and to the condition of pregnancy itself, in order to avoid acknowledging uh, women's agency in its creation. It's just um, a bizarre situation. <laughs> I mean, it really is, because on one hand, they attribute no personhood whatsoever to a fetus. Yeah. But then when it becomes convenient for them, they attribute all the agency and personhood that they can to say to, to keep the blame off themselves. Yep. It's, it's, they don't have any logical arguments. And I mean, the, the the sad thing is, like, I've had debate with women and with um, abortion advocates on the topic of pregnancy, child support, abortion, father's rights, um, paternal surrender, all of that stuff. Uh, and I've heard a range of arguments for abortion, against paternal surrender, for child support that at least have some level of logic to them based on um, various codes of ethics and morality. But these guys are just completely nuts. Yep. They, they, they don't make any arguments that have any validity at all. It's just, you know, me, me, mine, mine, uh, and, and I have a right. And they, if, if asked to support the premises behind their statements of rights and so on, they can't defend them and start misquoting fallacies, um, uh, rhetorical fallacies, like well, one that <laughs> one that keeps mention, it keeps thinking that any mention at all of nature, or acknowledge that nature, or acknowledgement that nature exists, constitutes a fallacious appeal to nature. Doesn't understand that you have to argue that something is right and good because it's natural, or better because it's natural, uh, to to make a fallacious appeal to nature. Um, they don't. They don't understand the things that they're referencing. Well, I mean, the whole like the 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 appeal to nature fallacy is more of the. It goes by another name of called the is ought fallacy. It is when you're trying to ascribe descriptions of nature to prescriptions of what we ought to do because of the nature. Right. Right. In other words, if I said. Um, a cesarean section is bad and uh, vaginal birth is better or important and, and we should always do it that way because that's natural childbirth. Um, it would ignore facts that sometimes make cesarean section necessary and uh, so it would be a fallacious appeal to nature. The fact that vaginal birth occurs naturally doesn't necessarily mean it's always better. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean that it's always um, right and good, or or that we should do it that way, uh, especially in, in situations where the baby is particularly large, or the mother's body is simply not accommodating uh, the size of the baby, even if the baby isn't large, or mm -hmm. other emergencies that, like, host of emergencies that can happen, right? So, <laughs> in this situation, the discussion is... Pregnancy is a predictable result of consensual sex if you don't take measures to interrupt the biological process of conception that sex sets in motion. That's true. And since it is a uh, biological process that is predictable, it cannot rightfully be said that conception is – uh, a violation of the the woman's bodily autonomy if she is – conceiving as a result of consensual sex and that she can didn't consent to conception when she consented to sex um, if she has the ability to prevent it and didn't choose to prevent it 
then she consented to it. Like that's consent. Um, but uh, yeah, these these women are basically arguing that it's not. Um, if they understood tacit consent, they wouldn't be feminist. No. I have one that just attributed agency to sperm. Damn. That's that's saying more than even pro-lifers go. <clears throat> I know. I was like, <laughs> so you're trying to laugh. I can't even laugh at it. It's sad. Like, literally, attributing agency to sperm. How can you do that? It doesn't have a brain. It will never have a brain unless conception happens and it becomes a zygote and then a fetus and, and then, you know, a baby, a zygote embryo, fetus, and then baby. Well, but, technically, well, I mean, technically, it's a bit of a misconception on that because the the sperm doesn't actually become the baby in a sense. No, it just contributes the genetic material that forms the, the yeah, that, that dictates the how the baby is formed. Yeah, once the genetic material is in, the sperm itself dies. Right. It isn't. It, it blows up basically to to sacrifice or sacrifices itself to deliver the. Uh, it's a delivery system for DNA. So um, it's basically an allegory for men in general. I guess to women, to to, to feminists in particular, there's a lot of women who see men that way. I guess. Um, yeah. it, that's another sad thing that I run into a lot. Um, when I when I talk about these various issues, people seem to want to discuss all men's issues, all gender issues, all human rights issues in general, as if men are accessories to the issues instead of actual human experiencers of the issues. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about suicide, for instance, it's easy for feminists to make the argument that male suicide is less relevant because women, quote, attempt more and there's two problems with this the first one is the death is the thing that makes suicide a problem mm -hmm. so obviously if men are dying more men are dying from suicide male suicide is a very relevant bigger problem than female suicide and uh the the other thing is claiming that women's uh, greater level of attempts, greater level of self-harm, all rep represent legit suicide attempts and therefore um, legitimize ignoring the, the issue of male suicide kind of um, – uses the argument wrong, I guess you could say. The, the feminist is making the wrong conclusion from the argument. Well, so, I – in the, I go by a simple George Carlin quote where I said, well, you know, men commit more suicide, but women attempt it more. So what it says is men are better at it. Yeah. Well, what it what it says to me is there are two different things going on here. Uh, and and there there's a psychology site that I've actually read this argument on as well. Um, if women are self-harming in ways that can appear to be attempts at suicide and not succeeding, it's very possible that the goal wasn't death. The goal was gaining um, the attention and compassion of the people around the woman. And there can be many reasons for that. It could be that she is legitimately uh, severely distressed over a lack of compassion from friends, family, the medical community, um, like I know my um my my best friend from elementary school when we grew up she developed a um a degenerative disc disease and um she was denied health care for that on the basis that and disability too on the basis that quote everybody has degenerative disc disease which is sort of a weasel truth it's not really true in in terms of the disorder, um, it is true that everybody has uh, disc degeneration in their spinal column as they age. The difference is degenerative disc disease puts you at like the age of 40 where your body would be maybe at the age of 80 after a lifetime of the same work and so on. 
Um, and when she engaged in self-harm, it was a clear attempt to communicate, I am in so much pain that this is unbearable. I need help. And um, she did it a couple of times. And everybody tried to help her. But because of the changes to the legislation in regard to what treatment people are allowed to have for this this disorder, um, basically, this is an incredibly painful disorder. It results in pinched nerves that uh, transfer pain down your limbs, um, sciatic nerve pain and uh, chest pain, uh, arm pain, um, pain that mimics carpal tunnel syndrome, head pain, all kinds of things. Um, it can be crippling, and uh, it requires surgical care and pain care, and that includes pain medication. Well, recently, in the last few years, uh, federal administrations have addressed the heroin um, and fentanyl uh, opiate crisis by denying pain medicine to people in her situation and people who have been injured at work and so on and uh, really haven't done anything at all about the heroin and fentanyl problems. So she could not get treatment and the, there was no accommodation. There was no nothing. It was basically just, well, you have to learn to live with this. Mm -hmm. And so that eventually the, then she did kill herself. Uh, when when her cries for help went unheeded, she killed herself. So a lot of women's um, suicide attempts are warning shots. And women will fire a warning shot to get that attention. A lot of men's suicide attempts, men don't do that most of the time until they have hit the point where they have already made the decision. I am going to do this. I'm not changing my mind. I'm not asking for help. I'm giving up. Um, and and seeking an escape. And so the reason that men's suicide is usually final, uh, in my opinion, is because men don't engage in that that type of self-harm um, mm -hmm. unless they mean it. And women do when they feel like maybe they can get some help changing their situation if they get people to understand if something doesn't change, I'm going to do this for real. Yeah, I mean, I think with many men, like, once they, I mean, because even, they've even done some tests on men that who weren't even suicidal, where they said, well, like, if you, because they wanted to test to see the aggressiveness of each sex. Yeah. And they said, basically, they gave them a test where they said, they gave women say, well, if you were going hypothetically to kill yourself, how would you do it? And they told that to women and they told that to men. Overwhelmingly, the methods of choice for women were things like cutting and uh, like trying to OD on pills. Yeah. Whereas with men, men, one of their most common things was crashing their car into a tree or up a cliff or shooting the are shooting themselves in the head. Yeah, men, men, when they attempt suicide, they usually try to use something that is going to be quick and permanent and, you know, not a large chance of failure. Um, of course, the other thing is when men do engage in self-destructive behavior, a lot of times um, it's not necessarily overtly suicidal. It's... Uh, other forms of uh, escape, thrill seeking, um, drug seeking, drinking, getting into fights and stuff like that. And that type of self-destructive behavior is it's not necessarily um, it's not necessarily willfully self-destructive so much as it is an attempt at coping where like women know that if we ask for help, most of the time we're going to get help. If we ask for help, most of the time we're going to get compassion. Um, we're going to have – people are going to try to understand what we're going through. Um, people are going to try to show compassion without harsh judgment and, and so on. And when we want to remedy a situation, people are going to try to hand us a remedy instead of giving us the tools to uh, effect change ourselves. 
And so for women, it's almost a passive process. And this is not to say that women don't involve engage in self-destructive behavior also, and even as an escape uh, method or, or, you know, things like that. But the difference with men is they don't have that necessarily. They don't have the condition of knowing that when they seek help, that people are going to treat them with compassion, that they are not going to be harshly judged, you know, and so on. So a lot of times when a man gets into a self-destructive mode, it's a coping mechanism for facing something he feels he can't overcome and can't ask for help uh, in overcoming because he'll simply be judged for, both for having the weakness and for asking help for it. But don't you know, Hannah, that the real sufferers of suicide is women because they lose their fathers, their brothers, and their male cousins? Oh my gosh, the um, uh, Thomas Ball incident where he set himself on fire in front of the courthouse. Feminists came out of the woodwork to claim that that was an act of abuse against his ex-wife. The man literally killed himself in one of the most painful ways humanly possible um, in order to demonstrate you know, the pain that he was in and the, the extremity of what led him to his suicide. And feminists tried to turn it into, you're abusing her. Yeah, I mean, that. I mean, it is funny. No matter what abuse that men go through, it's somehow always their fault or some other man's fault. It can, the, the possibility that women could be at the, the root of it is never even, you know, factored in. Yeah, it's not like, you know, Men have ever complained about not being allowed to see their children after divorce. You know, it's not like feminists haven't written articles about how painful it is for women to have to deal with 50-50 custody because then half the time their children aren't with them as if that you know ignores the man and how half the time the children are not with him. And it's not like most divorce is initiated by women or anything, is it? Yeah. Well, I mean, what people fail to realize is and this is something that's never going to ever be overcome, but, you know, and society has tried to overcome it, but women are naturally more connected to their children than, than men are. Right. We get the first, um, the first bonding that, that happens between a parent and a child happens during gestation. So we get the first, uh, dib naturally and, yeah. and it, and then we get the second dib, too, pretty naturally uh, we, with nursing. If, if a woman doesn't give up her opportunity to nurse or doesn't have a, a condition that prevents her from nursing, um, there's an incredible bond that's formed there as well. And uh, like a lot of chemical brain chemicals contribute to that bond. So, you know, dads do. And at, at infancy and young childhood, dads do have to work harder in order to form that bond. Although it doesn't um, it doesn't take away the importance of the the father child bond. And in fact, uh, the presence, the, the, the involvement of an involved father actually begins making a difference for the infant at birth. Um, so and actually, yeah. I mean, no one, you know, I would like no one saying it, you know, ever denies that men aren't important to it, although. Right. I mean, you know, what's funny is I've always said this, is that one of my biggest criticisms of the LGBTQ movement outside of them hating me for some reason, despite me actually supporting them 99% of the time, <laughs> it's, it's like my biggest complaint was the feminist of the LGBTQ movement that sought to use that in order to say, well, two women and two men can only well, well especially this they said well two women can raise a child you know two lesbians can raise a child so that means the man's irrelevant to the situation and this is yeah that's one that okay so for starters what you can do which you know two women can raise a child two men can raise a child that doesn't make it the ideal situation 
So in a in an LGBTQ situation, right? Let's say you have a child who is orphaned or who is uh, in foster care because the parents are actually abusive and uh, there's not a a good set of grandparents that wants to raise the child that would would benefit the child. There's not a good aunt and uncle that wants to raise a child. It's just a situation where the child is has had the worst possible luck in um you know who conceived this child and what family he or she was born into, uh, which is actually a rarity even among the children that are in foster care and even among the children that in foster care are made eligible for adoption. But let's say you have one of those children. Um, obviously, if there are parents seeking uh, to adopt a child, a heterosexual couple should be prioritized um, given all other equal circumstances. Um, obviously, the stipulations of being financially prepared and so on should be important. Those should be factors that can't be uh, removed. But if you end up in a situation where you're looking at a kid being tossed from foster home to foster home or a kid being raised, say, by two gay men, um, they, they, that is a not an ideal situation for the child. But it's yeah. an improvement um, from a situation where the environment is unpredictable and totally unstable for the child. Now, that, of course, relies on presuming that all of the factors that are necessary for an adoptive home uh, to be approved are in place and including the, you know, the stability of the relationship and all that. Um, so I, I would say, honestly, that should rely on a marriage, mm -hmm. um, you know, well, but at the same time, I mean, uh, if, I, I mean, well, if I like there was... If there was a heterosexual couple in line with all of the same factors, I still say between you know gay men and get gay women um, versus a heterosexual couple, it's in the child's best interest to go with a heterosexual couple. And it's just there's there is evidence of the importance of both sexes parenting this child. Well, I mean, what I've always said is is that, I mean. Yeah, I mean, well, here's the thing I always, um, I funny enough have said with it, is that whenever you're dealing with an adopted child situation, whether it's heterosexuals or homosexuals, bisexuals, or whoever that's doing it, the child knows if they're told, they're honestly told that they're adopted. Yeah. If they're homosexual, they sort of, if they figure that out on their own, but... Even, but even in heterosexual couples, where they tell the child that they're adopted, they like I believe it's seventy percent of the time the child wants to know who their biological biological parent, parents are. Yeah, they want to, and so I mean the downside is is that you know a child can be made can be fooled to believe that the heterosexual couple are actually their parents, but yeah. you actually fooled them into believing that two men or two women are actually their parents. You know, you can get a toddler to believe that, but as soon as they take such sex education, they're going to want to know who the hell their father is. Yeah. You know, and it, the truth is, um, and I, like adoption itself is not an ideal situation. Well, yeah, uh, but obviously there are times when it's, the best out of the available choices for a situation for, for a child. Um, and in, in that situation, you know, you, you do what you look at all the factors and you do what you can. And I mean, that's just the way it is. It's just like um, proper nutrition and um, a, a very healthy approach to pregnancy is the ideal situation in a pregnancy. Yeah. But there are things that occur like um, a genetic incompatibility that the uh, couple didn't know about or um, intolerance of certain types of foods in the mother and, uh, you know, that, that end up depriving her of nutrients that uh, she doesn't make up with or can't make up with via vitamins and, and supplements. And so sometimes there's harm done to the fetus in utero because of those situations. 
Um, and then other times, um, there are things that are completely unpre- unpredictable that can go wrong with a pregnancy. And you end up with a, a baby that has um, a disability. You end up with a baby that is born prematurely, and you have to really scramble to make sure that he or she is going to be okay, you know, and all kinds of stuff. Like, that's we deal with the way life is, not the way we want it to be. And yeah. uh, so I don't oppose gay ad- adoption. I don't oppose lesbian adoption. I don't oppose any of that. Um, I just like my position basically is we should look at the situation in terms of what the child will benefit from the most. And the decision should be based literally on the child's best interests. But we have to recognize what those interests are. And right now our society doesn't. And we'll probably see that continue until we get to a point where we are able to examine these issues without taking every um, statement of paternal importance and every recognition of um, uh, disadvantage that that can be caused to a child by taking away male influences uh, as as if it is some sort of misogynistic attack. And we have to be able to get past that before we can have this conversation honestly in society. But Hannah, don't you know that all of the bad outcomes of single motherhood just results from the fact that men aren't giving women enough money? Money. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I know that argument too. Um, and of course I've, I've actually had people argue in all seriousness to me that child support is for the child. It's not, it's for the government. Well, yeah, I mean, well, here's the thing that people don't like to hear about. This is the argument that I've made, and it has actually some historical basis. The reason why, you know, it went from default fatherhood to default motherhood, which, let me be clear, I'm against both. Yeah. I'm for 50-50. You know, I don't, I believe it's equally wrong for a man to be the default as it is for a woman to be the default. But I mean, in terms of equality's sake, it's equally. Now, if you want to, de- yeah. just, if you want to debate outcomes, then that's a different debate. But I'm talking about like in terms of principles. The best default, you know, if there has to be a, a custody arrangement where the parents aren't married, don't live together, aren't raising the child in the same home together. The best default is uh, 50-50 shared parenting, and the reason is because both parents' involvement is incredibly important to the child. Um, And and it's also beneficial to both parents because if you have a 50-50 custody arrangement um, that you can use to work around your work schedule so the child is in the mother's custody while the father's working and the father um, uh, has custody while the mother's working – um, that actually allows both parents the ability to create a, a household that can support the child and uh, would reduce the stress on both parents as well, yeah. you know, unless they cause each other stress by being oppositional to each other in, in regard to the trade-off and stuff. Yeah. I mean, like, here's how, well, I mean, this is how I've always really seen it. When it like, my, the argument I was going to get into is the reason why it changed to default motherhood was primarily to benefit the state. Yeah, it was. Because, well, here's the thing. When, because the default was, used to be, whoever had the most money was assumed to be the legal caretaker of the child. Nine out of ten, ten, that was the man. And uh, so... When you have that situation where the man is making more money and he has the default custody, the logic is since he has the default custody and he has more money, then it's more able to, he's more able to provide the the economics to be able to support the child and thus doesn't need to rely on the government as much. Whereas it changed to women who are, you know, on average of lower income than men. It became to them because the state wanted to say, well, how can we enlarge ourselves? Well, well, we can just simply give it to the the lower financial um, parent, um, namely the women. So because the women will have to to rely more on the government by default. 
Yeah, so what a lot of people don't realize actually is um, child support actually traces back to England's poor laws um, under Queen Elizabeth. And England, England's poor laws under Queen Elizabeth were partially necessitated by the dissolution of the monasteries under King Henry VIII. Um, the, the Catholic Church and its charities used to be the support system, the financial support system for people who were poor because they were down on their luck, people who were poor because they were disabled, uh, the elderly, orphans. And that system, like the, the church system, when they helped uh, the very poor, the, the elderly, the blind, the lame, you know, and anybody that was literally uh, poor due to circumstances beyond their control, they, they did look for ways for people to support, become self-supporting, right? And uh, so, and they did work to avoid um, supplying uh, laziness. So if you had somebody who basically was like, well, I'm going to just beg for a living instead of uh, engaging in some sort of labor, but I don't have anything that's a cause of my being poor. I'm not an orphan. I'm not old. I'm not disabled, you know, or, or anything like that. Um, and I haven't had some sort of disaster visited on my life that has taken away everything I had worked for up until this point. I'm just not going to work. Right. The the person in that situation, the church would work to get them to overcome that attitude, whether it was caused by, um, you know, depression, which they wouldn't have identified at the time or whether it was just pure laziness. They would work to overcome that. Um, but uh, when when the monasteries were um, pretty much shut down and drained by uh, by King Henry the eighth, that took away. Um, the church's responsibility and capability of supporting the poor in in England. And uh, what ended up resulting from that was the English parishes, which would be like uh, your neighborhoods, your uh, counties, basically. Your boroughs would be like your counties. Um, yeah. They they became responsible. So people went from going to the church to essentially going to the county for support. And a welfare system ended up being created workhouses and stuff like that some of that already existed but not to the degree that it ended up becoming necessary well then you had the great plague that went through and and destroyed so much of the population and you had um a situation of price gouging people refusing to work uh people going on the dole rather than working because they could and so on and um queen elizabeth uh, she started out with um, the 1576 Act for Setting of the Poor on Work and for the Avoiding of Idleness, because that's the way they named laws back then. Um, and then between uh, 1958 and 1948, or sorry, 19, uh, 19, 1598 and 1948, there were a whole series of poor laws that were um, created an act for the relief of the poor, which was like their first – um, consolidated welfare law. And um, then they continued on with m another one. Um, and uh, they had uh, laws dictating that um, uh, uh, the mother of any child that is um, labeled a bastard, uh, which they the, the label bastard applies to a child whose parents are not married. Uh, so the father is not taking responsibility for the child um according to the state uh that that she is required on threat of imprisonment to identify the father and uh then the father can be gone after for support so in in the 17th century um it was already stipulated and this was this was actually post elizabethan uh if i remember right might be wrong about that part, but uh, it was um, it was it was determined that you know the state could collect support for a child on 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 the child's behalf uh, from the father, and the mother was responsible for helping to identify the father. Um, and and then the other thing is uh, 
they they went through with this for not just children. Um, if you, for instance, if you lived in in England during the uh, the times of the poor laws, and in particular after the um, the plague when people were uh, price gouging and so on, um, if your cousin moved into a workhouse and was being supported by the state, and the state could identify you as your cousin's cousin. They might demand, they might bill you for your cousin's care. And the reason they did it was to encourage people to come and get their family members out of the poorhouse and bring them home to live with them, that families would be the first source of care for for the poor uh, instead of abandoning, abandoning them to the state. And all of that in history, um, that's been in place for centuries. So everything that United States has done in regard to like the welfare reform act of of uh, 2000 for instance and uh there was one similar to that in the 80s as well um the welfare to work all of that stuff that all has precedent in english common law uh much of which you know came about prior to the the formation of the united states as a nation and uh and it it's never been effective to have a state-run welfare system and then try to use regulation of, um, I guess you could say, mating habits and uh, financial relationships between citizens as a means of reducing dependence on that welfare system. And in particular, it has never been effective to uh, obligate fathers um, oh, and on behalf of women who have chosen to engage in consensual sex out of wedlock fail to interrupt the process of conception and and disrupt it in such a way that it cannot finish um and then carry to term and and choose to retain custody it's never been effective in preventing those women from from relying on uh state welfare of some sort or another to just turn around and obligate the father and uh, and go after him uh, you know yeah. you actually have to if you want to stop that from happening you have to not pay the woman to put herself in that situation in the first place yeah i mean a thing that i've always i mean i've also said is I've, i came to this conclusion as well is that from a feminist stand well i mean i mean uh, it depends on what you mean but if from a not from a feminist but i would say from a woman positive standpoint Things like abortion are absolutely really not in most women's best interest. Yeah. Because, I mean, because let's think about it this way. Let me assume the very worst character of men. I mean, think about it. Like, basically, a abortion is a get-out-of-child-support-free card for men yeah. that actually want to be a father. And... You know, just so people know, like, people know my personal backstory, I was the most pro-abortion advocate for the first 18 to 19 years of my life. And it wasn't until recently when I left my former religion, which I was a Christian, that I actually started wondering, well, wait a minute, what what are my beliefs that I could be wrong on? Yeah, and, yeah. And that was sort of one of them. I would say a group that helped me out, just to give a little shout out, would be called Secular Pro Life. Um, you know, I don't know if you know them, but they are a group founded by atheists and agnostics who are pro lifers. Okay, okay, that yeah. sounds like a good group, and it sounds like a very rational group. Um, and you know, for, my my journey has been sort of like that with um, the death penalty, but. Uh, I, you know, I always have been pro-life, um, and my reason for being pro-life in terms of abortion, um, essentially, we started sex education when I was 10. So I was old enough to understand everything that was being said in sex education, and I was young enough to have not talked myself yet into any excuses for ignoring the science of reproduction in order to uh, facilitate a belief that um, 
abortion does not represent the killing of a living human. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is something that I think a lot of um, a lot of people who discover the abortion issue discover it at an age when they're uh, they're old enough that they've they've started making those excuses. Well, my actions don't matter. My behavior is not bad. I'm not the person at fault if I end up in an unplanned and unwanted situation or a, an adverse situation. And therefore, I can't acknowledge that, uh, you know, I created a pregnancy and that it's a living thing. And, and if I kill it, it's dead. And that, that there are ethical considerations regarding the act of doing that. And of course, a lot of pro-abortion arguments have been so mainstreamed that people just take them for granted. Like um, the idea that a uh, condition a woman created through her own actions can be be a violation of her consent kind of comes from um, the the treatment of women's actions. Like the 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 idea that a woman has um, has a role in any sex act that she consents to, like that's been resisted uh, strongly by feminist uh, rape culture advocates, and they want to treat it as though no action a woman takes during a sex act is her doing or her fault unless she explicitly verbally agrees to it, even if she's the one taking the action. So we end up in a situation where when we discuss abortion, we are discussing abortion with people who are psychologically and mentally crippled in terms of examining the details of the issue Mm -hmm. well you know i mean i didn't even get into this part funny enough i usually get into this part early on but how did you actually get into men's rights well this is an interesting um this is an interesting question i get asked this all the time too I, i uh it's hard to say i was ever not into it and it's hard to 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 pinpoint a moment and say this is when I became a men's rights activist because I had activity um, that could be considered men's rights activity from the time I was a little kid. Uh, And I had, there were people around me that mistreated the boys that I grew up with that, and they did it because they were boys. And, uh, you know, and I, I objected. I responded to that. I once defended, like, my first little boyfriend was an oddball. Um, when he when we got older, like, he had moved away, and I, I ran into him again and, um, you know, found out that he was bisexual and all kinds of um, information that I would not have figured out as a kid because I wouldn't have a way to sort of, you know, you don't have a gaydar when you're, like, four and five and six and seven which is the ages when we started hanging out together and playing together and you know so this was this was like the boyfriend girlfriend kind of thing where you say yes this is my boyfriend this is my girlfriend but you don't know what to do about it um so you just spend all your time together uh but this kid had a shirt that he liked it was actually probably one of his only expensive articles of clothing it was a polo shirt with the alligator on you know, like one of those really, really nice shirts, but um, it was it was from Goodwill. And so his mom just let him wear it all the time and he felt classy in it, but it was pink and it wasn't the boys who objected to him wearing it. It was our female friends. Well, one day some other girls heard our female friends razzing him about it. And when um, it was just me and him and the other girls that were not our friends at the park, they all came over and started bullying him. And uh, like, that's probably my er earliest uh, standing up against somebody saying, you can't do this because you're a boy. Um, And I probably, if they had called my bluff, would have gotten my ass kicked. But they were so shocked at this stupid little girl that stood up and yelled at all four of them and put her fists up that they like backed off and wandered over to the other side of that part of the playground and just stood around and made fun of us quietly over there. Um, and with, with enough, you know, gestures and, and, uh, 
giggling and stuff that you know we were supposed to know they were making fun of us but we really didn't care about that as long as nobody was getting beat up um and that like i watched stuff like that happen all the time i knew uh friends that got accused of uh engaging in behaviors that they didn't engage in uh, because they were boys um getting accused of bullying because they were boys getting accused of looking at somebody like looking at somebody is a a, a big deal um, I had, uh, a classmate who crank called me and even this is my, like my parents were good people, but they were still gynocentric to a degree. And, uh, they, they freaked out over the crank calls because the classmate was a boy and they actually took out a restraining order because the kid wouldn't stop calling. Um, and, uh, it really made a mess for him. And I, I. Did he say stuff like, hey, is your refrigerator running? No, he actually asked me what I was wearing. But uh, he, you got to understand, adults, when they ask that, they're looking for sexual stimulation. This boy was actually curious if I had changed into my play clothes after school. You know, he, I think he was wanting to invite me to the park to play because I talked to him in class. And a lot of the other kids didn't. Um, and he ended up having he he was um, he had a really rough time. This is a boy who had uh, the rare condition of experiencing overt symptoms of schizophrenia as a young child, and he didn't know what was going on. He didn't understand why he couldn't keep track of of um, like his his uh, sensory input. And he didn't understand why he couldn't keep his train of thought. Uh, so he acted out in class a lot. And he had a reputation for, you know, being one of the bad kids because of that. But he wasn't one of the bad kids. He was a kid who was having a very rough time. And it wasn't until we were in junior high, I got my my mom to understand um, some of the things that were going on with him. Um, I almost accidentally got him into trouble with this, but... That happened when we were in the fourth grade. The crank calls happened when we were in the fourth grade. So we had this restraining order, right? Um, my fifth grade teacher left us inside the classroom alone together at recess. Um, and uh, I had to stay inside at recess because um, under certain temperatures with the type of asthma I had as a child, I would get this out of control formation of mucus in my lungs and my uh my uh, trachea and it would cause me to choke and cough and stuff so if the weather was below that temperature i couldn't go outside and play with the other kids i had to sit inside and read quietly which didn't bother me because i like to read but this boy was stuck inside because he hadn't finished homework that he really didn't he couldn't find a starting point to do the homework it was writing a short story and i looked over and he was sitting at his desk crying and I couldn't stand it like it's this was this was a kid who was, you know, he wasn't mean. He wasn't bad. He wasn't scary or dangerous or anything like that. He just was another kid. So I just looked over and saw another kid crying. And even though I wasn't supposed to talk to him, I went over and asked him what was wrong. And he told me, even though he wasn't supposed to talk to me, that he had to write a story and he didn't know how. And. I took him through the writing process as we had learned it in class, how to create his setting, how to create his main character of the story, um, and how to create a conflict in the story. And, you know, whether it's the main character versus other people or nature or whatever, the circumstance, and, uh, and then how to write a beginning, a middle, and an end for the story. Uh, and he did it. And, of course, the teacher went around. And she had not been in the classroom for the whole time. I, I solved the kid's problem. And um, he was he was relieved and happy. And the teacher bragged to everybody that she'd gotten him to do homework. And when I had actually gotten him to do homework. Um, I was 11 when that happened. Well, like two, two years later. There was a incident where my mother and my grandfather and I were walking along. Uh, the community I grew up with is along the Miami and Erie Canal system. And there is a 
a wooded pathway along that canal called a towpath that was created uh, for for um, mules to pull the canal boats. And it's now just a nature walk area. And we're walking through there and we hear this bonking noise and a dog yelping. And it was just horrible. We knew somebody was abusing an animal somewhere nearby. And so we uh, we went hurrying over in that direction only to find this boy and another boy from our neighborhood. Um, and they were both just sobbing. And they had this dog and a rope and a shovel. And they're going, I can't do it. You do it. No, I can't do it. You do it. And my mom just like barged right over there. What's going on here? Well, of course, my mom was a school teacher. And she uh, she taught at an inner city school. So when she radiated authority, she radiated authority. She had to. She was like five foot five and 90 pounds soaking wet with rocks in her pockets. And she taught kids that were in gangs. And uh, she taught kids that were in gangs during a time of racial tensions that's pretty equivalent to what's going on now it was uh, the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s. So when she walked up to those boys and demanded to know what was going on, they just instantly told her Um, the other boy's father had ordered them to kill the dog because he didn't want it anymore. And he'd sent them out there to do that. And um, so mom, this was back in the uh, 80s when you could actually, in small towns at least, rely on the local government to do right by your family. And... You know, she had to uh, turn the situation into the police, but then she went into court and advocated for those boys to make sure that they were not treated as criminals for being abused by this nut job of a dad. And um, the other boy was like our town's version of Huck Finn, honestly. He was practically homeless. He slept in people's garages. His He had parents, and his parents just completely neglected him. Um, so what ended up happening was both boys got state-funded help, and the boy that had been my crank caller got his diagnosis, and he got therapy, and he got medication, and his family got therapy to help him and he ended up uh, in a much better situation. And um, he was able, he got a job as he came back and talked to me about this in high school. And he had a job that he was a good reader. He enjoyed reading. And, and he said, I, I owe all of that to your mom. You know, and the, the hard part is like schizophrenics are at some of the highest risk for suicide. And ultimately, over time, we did lose him to suicide because of the symptoms of his schizophrenia, that he could not handle those symptoms. Um, but he would never have had any any happiness, any stability, any um, self-actualization where he achieved things by his own actions and felt defined by what he did. You know, um, He never would have had any of that if somebody hadn't stepped forward and said, I understand what's going on here and I can help. Um, his family didn't have that knowledge. The school hadn't made the effort. And uh, if mom had just thrown the situation to the cops and said, you deal with it and not stepped forward. Um, I think that those guys would have just gone to JDC and gotten put on a path to criminality. Um, and so you could say it's kind of a hereditary thing, um, but that kind of uh, interaction, uh, you know, like it mom figured out, you know, this kid's not bad and what he was doing wasn't intentionally bad boy going after girl behavior at that point. Uh, she figured out he had some needs that needed to be met and uh, then she helped him and figuring that out made a huge difference for me. And as as things progressed with people around me, um, when I first started seeing uh, injustices in the court system as a result of the Violence Against Women Act, I was already aware of the problems with the act. You mean Mm -hmm. the the feminist version of the Patriot Act? It's it's um, 
It's kind of worse than that. The Patriot Act purports to actually look for criminality where there might be criminality. The Violence Against Women Act takes an, a phenomenon that is largely psychological. And I know violence is physical, but interpersonal violence within a, uh, a domestic partnership is a failure of um, um, not just intimacy, but um, compromise, a failure of uh, ability to deal with conflict in a relationship. And uh, so it's it's not necessarily it it's not malicious in 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 the same way that terrorism is malicious. And feminists would hate me for saying that. They would quote that and say, Hannah thinks that domestic violence isn't bad. It's very bad, but it's it's a failure, a well, handicap, I, not yeah. not an attack on society like feminists make it out to be. So I the believe, Violence Against Women Act is a perversion of the Family Violence Prevention and Services Act, which was intended to treat that psychological social disease and uh, turned it into almost a uh, an a, an inquisition, a witchcraft style in, inquisition against men. And the bad thing about the Violence Against Women Act is if it was purported to help women, it's failed. Oh, yeah, it's very damaging um, to everybody involved, including women. Yeah, I mean, because think about it like this way. You know, men who are legitimately perpetrators of domestic violence, they usually have something, you know, previously wrong with them. Right. They have, like, maybe drug abuse, sexual abuse as a child. Like, they, you know, men that are, and but... When we do assume that men are the perpetrators, I mean, yeah, on one hand, that's bad because he could actually be the victim or at least a neutral, um, a just as guilty party. But the thing is, is when men get treated like the, like when men are actually the perpetrators and they, they get rightly treated as one, well, yeah. that, that sort of gives men the opportunity to do some reflection and say, oh, well, I have to get my life together. But when you're a woman and you're a perpetrator, you don't get that. Well, part of the problem is people misunderstand the causes behind domestic violence. Uh, you know, like it's not like a bar fight where sometimes bar fights happen because somebody is just an asshole and uh, they they um, use violence as a means of self-entertainment or to get what they want or they attack somebody because they have a prejudice, you know, whatever. Uh, and and. Other forms of criminal violence like mugging, burglary, um, you know, rape and all of that also happen because the aggressor is um, malicious toward the target and is messed up in a way that makes them so. But domestic violence generally um, it's it's like I said, most of the time it's two way, like I've said before. Um, I don't think I've said it here, but it generally occurs because of conflicts that exist within the relationship not being handled effectively and um, efficiently and, and uh, with best interest of the people in mind, the people involved in mind, um, by the people involved. So you end up with uh, essentially conflict over things that they have in common and that they have a common interest in um, erupting into violence because they aren't able to otherwise deal with the conflict so for example the rent um and this would be like we probably have seen this uh ramp up a bit during the pandemic when a lot of people were out of work you know if people were a low income to begin with they got in the united states they actually got more money for being out of work but if people were middle class and upper middle class, there's a point in your income at which even the increased amount of unemployment isn't enough to make up for what you lost by being out of work if your job was considered non-essential. And uh, that would hit people whose um, factory work was shut down if they were if they were getting paid, you know, pretty high amounts per hour to do things like making tires and stuff like that. Uh, where they were working in environments that were maybe dangerous enough that they would get higher pay. And 
that would create a situation that even with stimulus money and everything, some people were – they had to tighten their belts. And the other thing that happened, of course, was that there were product unavailability because – or unavailability because uh, the supply chain 